Hi, this is Joe Hage, and I have the privilege of leading your medical devices group, which, as of this recording, has 345,000 members worldwide. And one of the reasons we've grown as large as we have is we have educated members like Doug Limbaugh. He is an attorney with Shea Glenn, and he's going to teach us today about how to check your patents for loopholes. Doug, take it away and have a good show. I will be on mute. Okay. Thanks, Joe. And welcome to everybody joining the, the webinar today. Uh, as Joe said, I'm going to walk through uh, a number of things. You can check your existing patents uh, for potential problems. You don't have to be uh, that knowledgeable about patent law. These are some tips. You can uh, quickly go through your existing patents and uh, look for problems, and I'll tell you what to, you may be able to do about them. Uh, and certainly you want to keep these things in mind when creating uh, new patents. And uh, you can also uh, check through your competitors' patents. And if you find some of these problems, uh, you may be able to use them to your advantage. So let's see. I'm trying to get the screen to advance. It doesn't appear to be advancing on screen here. Here we go. Okay, so here's an, an overview of the uh, eight different types of problems uh, that are can be uh, commonly found and uh, fairly easy to, to spot. So I'll walk through these as an overview here. Uh, the first is uh, patent profanity. This is a term that uh, I believe was coined by Tom Finnegan, I mean, sorry, Tom Urban, uh, Finnegan Henderson. He's a patent attorney and uh, has identified I, these types of um, terms as, as patent profanity because they're, they're the type of words that are, are just so bad you, you don't want to see them uttered in a, a patent. Uh, and I'll walk through the, uh, how those can, can cause you uh, problems and what you can do about those. Uh, not only in your patents, but in, uh, when you're corresponding with the patent office, you want to avoid using these type of terms as patent profanity. Uh, the second type of loophole I'll talk about is something called objects of the invention. Um, and you don't want to use those in general in, in your patents. Um, the third thing is misuse of the word invention. Uh, there's no need to even use the word invention anymore when you're uh, writing uh, your patent applications. Uh, the fourth loophole is something called means plus function language. Uh, something you should avoid using, or if you're going to use, you want to uh, use uh, very carefully. Uh, the fifth type of loophole is claims that are overly detailed or not focused on the right features. Also talk about keeping your patent families alive. And the seventh uh, thing you should keep in mind is, is coordinating the efforts between your patent and regulatory folks. And the last uh, item I'll, I'll be talking about is marking your products with, with patent information. Um, so first, just a, some quick background uh, on myself. Um, I've been doing uh, patent law, uh, intellectual property law for 23 years now. Um, my experience includes working in a multinational uh, general practice law firm. Uh, I've worked in IP boutique law firms uh, like the one I'm in now. I've also been in-house counsel uh, and uh, had the good fortune of uh, to work in-house at one medical device startup that was acquired for $1.2 billion uh, just uh, seven years after its uh, inception. Um, I also uh, was a founder of a mobile device startup company, so that exposed me to uh, a number of issues that a lot of uh, early stage companies are, are facing. Uh, I think that's helped me represent uh, early stage companies better. Uh, before going into patent law, uh, I spent six years as an electromechanical engineer, uh, mainly in the fields of uh, robotics and industrial automation, but also uh, did some work uh, in medical device and, and medical equipment uh, as an engineer. And uh, my technical degree is in mechanical engineering. Um, the firm uh, I'm with, I've been here, uh, just celebrated my 10th year anniversary here at Shea Glenn. 
We're a 12 attorney uh, law firm in Silicon Valley, uh, do nothing but uh, intellectual property law. Uh, as I said, we were formed uh, over 10 years ago. Um, we specialize in counseling early stage uh, companies and the VCs and other investors who, who invest in those early stage companies. About 80 to 90 percent of our work is in the medical device uh, life science area. Uh, many of us here have previous litigation experience, uh, but we're not doing uh, litigation now, uh, which is part of why our rates uh, tend to be about 25 percent lower than the large law firms. Uh, here um, are each of the, the patent attorneys here uh, has a, a, at least a, has a, a technical degree and, and often an advanced uh, degree, and here are the degrees that uh, our patent attorneys hold. We've got degrees in aerospace, biomedical, chemical, electrical, material science, mechanical, neuroscience, and optical engineering. And just oh, one last bit of uh, housekeeping. I uh, have to remind everyone that this, the information provided in this, this webinar is, is for educational purposes only. It's not a substitute for obtaining legal advice regarding your specific situation. And uh, just listening to the information in this webinar uh, and contacting me, which I encourage you to do, does not in itself create an attorney-client relationship. Uh, that only happens when, when both of us uh, agree that's up what we want to do uh, and do that in writing. Uh, and any views uh, state that I state here in the webinar are, are mine only and may not necessarily be shared by my law firm or uh, its clients. Why am I not surprised that a lawyer had this in his presentation? <laughs> hey, I didn't start with it. I'd Sorry. To the Please continue. Sixth slide. <laughs> Go ahead. So the, uh, getting into the, the actual subject matter here, the first type of loophole uh, that I mentioned is, is patent profanity. And uh, I think the best way to, to illustrate the dangers of using patent profanity in your, your patents is with a story about uh, two implantable battery companies. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, an attorney I have worked with uh, was representing an, uh, an implantable battery company. Uh, they'd come up with a, developed a, uh, a new uh, battery that, that looked very promising. Uh, they'd just gotten funding and were about to ramp up uh, production of this battery. And, um, at that time, they, they discovered uh, a patent held by another implantable battery company that read right on their, their new device. Um, so their initial thought was, oh, you know, we're dead in the water. This, this patent covers us. We're going to have to, you know, stop ramping up production, figure out what to do, either redesign the, the battery or you know, figure out a way around this patent if it uh, looked like the patent was going to keep them from uh, developing and, and selling this, this battery. Uh, but this patent attorney, a uh, good, great patent attorney actually, um, he uh, delved into the, the detailed description of the patent. I mean, normally it's the claims at the end of the patent that determine whether the patent covers the device or not. But he delved into the, the, the detailed description section of the, of the patent and found a, a sentence or two in there that uh, used uh, one of these patent profanity words. The word was necessary. And the, the patent talked about how this one particular feature was necessary to have um, in order to get uh, the results uh, that the patent had talked about. Uh, and so normally that one feature, if it's not in the claims, would not be required uh, to infringe the claims. Uh, but because uh, uh, the way they use this patent profanity, um, this lawyer was able to determine that you know, based on the case law, a court would read that limitation, that, that element that the patentee had said was necessary, that would read that into the claims and the claims would require that that element for infringement, and, and fortunately for uh, this attorney's client, they didn't have that element in their battery. So they were able to sidestep this patent. You know, this, this other battery company had spent a lot of time and money on this patent and had the opportunity to 
uh, knock this competitor out uh, before they got started. Uh, but because of this patent profanity and their, their detailed description, uh, their patent really became ineffective against um, this, this other company. Uh, so uh, let me dig down a little deeper into the details of how this works. Uh, as I said, normally it's the claim language that determines the, the, the scope of a, uh, a patent. And, and claims are, for those that are not familiar with, with patents, claims are the, the numbered paragraphs at the end of the, the patent. Um, they're, uh, and it's uh, the claims, not the written description or the drawings of a patent that precisely define what is and what is not covered by the patent. Uh, and to get a, a claim through the patent office, you want to put just enough elements into the claim to get it allowed, uh, but no more than that. And so I've got two example claims up here, um, a broader claim on the left and a narrower claim on the right. Claim two is, is narrower. And the only difference between the two is um, claim two has element D uh, as well. Uh, claim one just has elements A, B, and C, and uh, claim two has A, B, C, and D. Uh, and it, it may be a little counterintuitive. Uh, I think the more elements in a claim, the, the broader, the more things it covers. It, it's actually the opposite. You want a, a claim like claim one that's got just, a, just the three elements, A, B, and C. Uh, and if you have to add element D, uh, as in claim two, um, to get it through the patent office, um, that's going to be a narrower um, narrower claim. Um, and so in the case of the, these two battery companies, uh, the, my uh, attorney colleague uh, that represented this one company, for, they fortunately did not have element D. Uh, I don't recall what it was. It was uh, you know, an extra layer or a, uh, uh, an electrode or a contact or, or some feature on their device uh, that was required that ultimately was required by the patent that they did not have. And so, um, as I said, normally it's just the claims that stand on their own that determine the scope of the invention. They are interpreted in light of the description section of the patent. So sometimes um, there'll be some ambiguity of what a claim term means, and you, courts will need to go to uh, the detailed description and, and to shed light on what exactly do does, does those claim elements mean. And in this case, they actually imported a claim element uh, from the detailed description section of the patent into the claims uh, that caused the problem. Um, and so here I've kind of graphically illustrated that on the left, uh, the detailed description section of the, the patent uh, discusses elements A through Z to talk about all these different elements of the batteries um, and they show them in the, in the drawings. But in the claim section, the, the, the patent attorneys uh, had only claimed elements A through C, trying to keep the, the claims quite broad. Um, but in uh, this case, because they had used the word necessary uh, when referring to element D, uh, that element was read into the claims and the claims became narrower and, and no longer covered this uh, battery company. So there are um, a number of other words besides necessary that uh, are considered patent profanity that can trip you up and they're, they're shown here. Um, you can uh, see that there, uh, if you use the word always, solely, fundamental, preferable, key, important, must, peculiar, critical, necessarily, preferred embodiment, superior, essential, or special, words like this that really highlight an element uh, when you're talking about it in the description can uh, be too strong and um, cause you problems where, uh, if you use this type of patent profanity, these elements, when described that way, can be, uh, end up in your claims when you don't want them there. So uh, my recommendation would be uh, for you to scan your, your patents for these words uh, and, and note how the words are used. 
Um, if you find them in the, the first section of the patent, the background, maybe they're, they're not such a problem. But any other section of the, of the patent, uh, the summary section or the detailed description or the abstract, um, if, if these words are used, it's a red flag that you, you may have some, uh, some problems and your claims may not be as broad as you, you think they are. Um, so what do you do when you find one or more of these words in your patent or your patent applications? and it appears that the word is, is being used in a, a limiting fashion. Well, if, if you're involved in writing or reviewing your patent applications, it's, it's far better to remove these words before the patent application is ever filed. That's the easy thing to do. Um, once the application is filed at the patent office, it can be difficult to change the language of the application other than, than to fix typographical or, or grammatical errors. And once the application issues into a patent, it becomes even more difficult to remove these offending words. So uh, I recommend you, you talk to your patent attorney about uh, your specific situation to see if anything should and can be done to, to improve the situation. Even if nothing can be done to correct the problem uh, in the existing application or the issued patent, you can at least ensure the problem is not propagated in, in future patent applications. And uh, as I alluded to at the beginning of the, the webinar, uh, if you find patent profanity in your competitor's patents, uh, there's a good chance you will be able to exploit it uh, to your benefit and uh, they get around some of their claims. So uh, I think that's it for patent profanity. Um, let's talk about the second type of loop, loophole, and that's objects of the invention. Uh, Objects of the invention used to be very commonplace in, in patents. Uh, almost all patents used to have, you know, in the summary section, uh, just a listing of you know, what the objects of the invention are. You might have one or two dozen things that, uh, you know, paragraphs, each one saying an object of the invention is this or that, um, trying to uh, show the world what, what the highlights are of the, the invention. Uh, and they would be used to, to list the various features of an invention. Uh, they fell out of favor uh, several decades ago, actually, um, because defense counsel can go through the objects of the invention and show how some or, or none of them apply to their client's device. Uh, so an example uh, given here, uh, the one shown under uh, problematic, um, is it is an, an object of the present invention to provide an improved vertebral distraction device for use in disectomy procedures. So a distraction device is something that spreads two uh, vertebrae apart uh, in a disectomy procedure which, uh, where you're removing the disc between the two vertebrae. Uh, and how this can be a problem is uh, a potential infringer may have a distraction device that's otherwise covered by the claims of your patent, uh, but you've said, well, it's, it's an object of the present invention to use it in a disectomy procedure. They may not use it in a disectomy procedure. They may um, use it in a motion-preserving uh, procedure that, that just is aligning the spine or is doing something else. And so if you've got one or more of these objects of the invention in your uh, the summary section of your, your patent. Um, their defense counsel can, your competitor can say, hey, we, we don't do this, this, and this, and they can quickly sway a jury uh, to believe that, hey, your, your patent is completely different. It's covering things that uh, we don't do. So the simple solution here is you just don't use objects of the invention. Um, Instead, you would say something like, uh, is shown here, according to some aspects of the present disclosure, an improved vertebral distraction devices uh, for use in disectomy procedures is provided. Or you could say something like, in some embodiments, an improved vertebral distraction device may be used in disectomy procedures. So you're still getting the information across, but you're just not using these, uh, this wording, objects in the invention, that, that can come back to bite you. So uh, what do you do if you find these objects of the invention listed in your patent applications? Uh, like patent profanity, uh, objects of the invention can be difficult to remove after the, the patent application has been filed. 
or if it's issued into a patent. Although in some situations it may be possible to change the language uh, as I just described in the previous slide after that application has been filed. But it's good to know at least you know, you've got these potential problems in there. You should look through your patents and see if you've got, uh, you'll see in the summary section uh, it may say uh, an object of the invention is and, and list some feature. Uh, ideally you, you don't want that in there. So the third type of loophole is misuse of the word invention. And in general, um, you, you really don't even need to use the word invention. Uh, it used to be used all the time. Uh, typically, you'd, you'd find the word invention all throughout a, a patent. But in, in recent years, um, people, have, uh, patent attorneys have figured out that that can really come back to bite you and, and be used against you. In, in court when you're trying to assert your patent, so uh, best to just keep that, that word out. Um, as I had said before, your invention should be defined by the claims section of your patent and not by other sections of the patent. And when you've got the word invention listed uh, in your detailed description, um, it can uh, cause problems and, and uh, allow the other, uh, your opposing counsel to uh, define for themselves what, what uh, is or is not your invention. So anytime you use the word invention in the summary section um, of your patent, you're, you're inviting defense counsel to redefine um, to their advantage what is, in, what is and what is not your invention. So uh, the example given up here is under problematic. Um, the present invention provides a lever arm for adjusting the spine. Um, if uh, a competitor uh, has a spinal adjustment device that doesn't have a lever arm, um, they can use this this statement against you saying, well, you, you say, you, you know, not only do you have a lever arm, that, but your present invention uh, has a lever arm for adjusting the spine. And um, much like patent profanity, the, that can change the meaning of the claims uh, by this statement that's not in the claims. It's in the, another section of the patent. Um, so just avoiding the word invention altogether gets around that. So you can say something instead, like uh, in some implementations of the present disclosure, a lever arm is provided, or you could say a, a lever arm may be provided for adjusting the spine, and that that won't be used against you. Still get the information across, but not uh, uh, limiting yourself. Doug Colin asks, the, uh, I guess with the word invention, most things are recognized as being already invented and then most new ideas are merely using an original invention. And he asked, is that an accurate reflection of why not to use the word invention? Um, I'd say that's partly right, that, uh, that um, in some cases it may have already been invented, uh, but in a lot of situations, the person drafting the patent applications believes this is the invention. At the time, they're thinking, hey, you, you have to have a lever arm. This is, this is part of the invention. But they're unnecessarily limiting themselves uh, in that way. It, it's, it's the claims uh, that you want to define your, your application or your, your invention with the claims. And the claims will change over the years. Um, but these statements can't be changed when you say the present invention is this or it is not that. Uh, those that wording in the detailed description cannot be changed, and it kind of locks you down. Um, if you don't have those those words in there, um, you can change the claims at a later date and and not be bound by uh, uh, what what you've originally thought was your invention. It looks as though a find and replace of the word invention for the word disclosure will do just fine. Exactly. Yep. That, that's a, uh, a good way to fix the problem. Just take out invention and replace it with disclosure. Uh, 
and even in the headings. It used to be headings of, of well, you'll see older patents, and sometimes you know patents that are being written today will say summary of the invention, and that section just should be changed. The heading should be changed to summary of the disclosure or just summary. Same thing with the detailed description section and the background section. Uh, just leave out the word invention. Okay. Um, so uh, you should scan your patents and applications for the word invention. Uh, this word rarely is needed in a patent application, and, and when it's used, it's a red flag that there may be potential problems. And like patent profanity and objects of the invention, the earlier you detect these potential loopholes, uh, the easier they are uh, to change. So the fourth type of loophole I want to talk about is means plus function language. Uh, means plus function language, um, I guess the easiest way to explain what it is is to provide an example. So in a claim, uh, you can either recite, uh, as shown here under problematic, a means for fastening part A to part B, or you can directly recite the element, a fastener, and, and say it, it, it's used to fasten part A to part B. Um, so this means plus function language comes from, uh, it's provided by statute. Uh, the statute provides that a claim element may be expressed as a means for performing a particular function without the recital of uh, actual structure and the claim will be construed to cover the corresponding structure that's been described in the specification and the equivalence of that structure. Uh, so oftentimes um, patent attorneys will, will put uh, a means for fastening part A to part B in there they're thinking, okay, I want it to cover a nail, a screw, a bolt, a rivet, a clamp, a weld, glue, epoxy, any possible way of fastening part A to part B. Uh, but the reality is that uh, means plus function language is going to be in, most often interpreted more narrowly. Unless you've done an outstanding job of thinking of all the ways you can fasten part A to part B, uh, and described it in great detail in your detailed description section of the patent, you're, you're limiting yourself by using means plus function language. You'd be, uh, it's going to only cover those things you specifically laid out, whereas if you had a claim that said a fastener or another claim that said a weld, yeah, you're going to get um, much broader coverage uh, and make it harder for your competitors to design around your patent by coming up with a, another way of, of fastening part A to part B. Um, and if there's no corresponding structure given in the specification for your means plus function language, then that means plus function term will be considered indefinite and it renders the claim invalid. Um, this is the problem a lot of times when means plus function language is used in a claim. The claim can be invalidated because uh, the patent attorney hadn't put enough uh, corresponding structure in the description, or, or none at all. Um, when I started practicing patent law in the early 90s, probably a, a quarter to a third of all patents had means plus function language in them in at least one of the claims. And that percentage of uh, patents has steadily declined over the years, and, and now it's down to about 5%. And I think that's uh, you know because uh, attorneys have realized uh, through different uh, cases and watching patents get invalidated or, or not cut, do what they're supposed to, uh, they just see how uh, means plus function language is um, usually not very effective. So on occasion, means plus function language can serve a valuable purpose, uh, but more often than not, when you see it in a patent or, or an application these days, especially if it's used in every single claim, it's being used incorrectly and is narrowing the scope of the claims. So scan your patents and applications for the word means or means for. And the good news here is that in general, you, you can change means plus function language in a claim at any time while a patent application is still pending. And for patents that have already issued, you can file new claims without the offending means plus function language um, you can do that in a, a continuing application 
as long as you've kept the, the patent family alive. And I'll explain what it means to keep a patent family alive when I discuss that loophole uh, a bit later. So the fifth type of loophole is um, having overly detailed claims or claims that are not focused on the right features. Uh, and compared to the, the, the previous loopholes we've been talking about, uh, these potential loopholes do not lend themselves to quickly scanning through your patents. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of, um, of these two uh, issues, uh, both claim length and, and claim focus. And uh, you, you can get a sense by studying your patents um, you know, whether the, the, you may have an issue with the, the claims being too detailed or, or focused on the wrong things. So uh, regarding claim length, Patent attorneys have joked for years that the, the way the patent office determines whether a claim is patentable is that the patent examiners use the one-hand rule, which says that if they can put their hand over your claim and cover it up with their, their hand, then it's too short and therefore uh, it's not patentable. On the other hand, if they can't um, cover their your claim with one, one hand, um, it, sticks out on either side, uh, then the claim's long enough and they, they can grant you that claim. Obviously, uh, it's not nearly as simple as that, uh, but in general, I mean, uh, there is some truth to the one-hand rule that, uh, you know, the longer the claim is, uh, the more likely it is to, to be patentable, and if it's shorter, it's, it, uh, you may run into problems getting it through the, the patent office. So it's a balance. I mean, you, you, ideally, you'd like to have your claims uh, as short as possible. That means they're broad. Uh, but that means it's difficult to get through the patent office, and it may be easy for your competitors to invalidate them uh, after you do have an issued patent. But if you've got short claims, uh, it, it makes it much easier to, um, to ensure they cover what your competitor's doing. Conversely, if you've got long claims, they um, uh, typically are going to be easier to get through the patent office and, and are going to be uh, uh, harder to invalidate, but uh, they will be easier for your competitors to, to find a feature or two that uh, they don't have or that they can remove or, or change on their device to, to get around that claim and so it doesn't, uh, your patent won't cover them. So how long a claim should be all depends on the invention and it depends on the, the prior art that came before your invention. But you can at least get a general sense of how detailed uh, your claims are by looking at their length. Uh, if they fit under one hand, um, you're, you're probably in good shape. If they fill an entire column or two, uh, when patents are printed out, there, there's two columns per page. If they fill an entire column and spill onto the next column or even if sometimes you'll see a claim that spills onto a second page, um, filling two columns. Odds are when they're, they're getting that long and detailed, um, they're probably not worth much. And um, so if you've got a, some longer claims, it would be worth inquiring with your patent attorney as, as to why that's necessary. And maybe you want to sit down with your patent attorney and, and go through and, and see if there's some elements there that can be removed. Uh, to shorten up the claim to make it make it broader. Uh, and so the second uh, aspect of this is is claim focus. What what should the claim be focusing on uh, to make it most valuable? Uh, and in general, the claims uh, should be focused on uh, not on the you know the most complicated technology you've got or the the hardest thing it was for you to come up with or the most impressive or sexy technology you've got. It should be the commercial features of your product that, that give you an advantage in the marketplace. Oftentimes those are, are very plain, simple, uh, seemingly obvious features, uh, and it may be difficult to get patent protection on those, but that's really what you want to focus your, your claims on, because that's what you want to protect. You want your claims, uh, those type of claims, to keep your competitors from having that same feature. You want to be in the situation where um, 
patients and, and, and physicians are saying, yeah, I want the device that's got that, that one little feature on it, and that's what you provide, and that's what your patents cover and keep other people from providing. And I've got an example pictured here. Um, this is when I was in-house at, at uh, Theracense. Uh, it's a blood glucose monitoring company. We made the freestyle meter that's down in the, the lower left side of uh, that picture showing all those blood glucose meters. And um, the, there's a, uh, on, the test strip is shown there on the left uh, that fits into the meter. And the, the left side of the strip is the, the end of the, the test strip that goes into the meter. And the right side is with the two semicircles on it is where you apply a drop of blood uh, to um, check the, the, the glucose level in, in the blood. And in, in that working end, uh, that right side of the, the test strip, there's just uh, amazing technology that's going on with uh, how it's manufactured and the, the tolerances of the microchannels in there and the electrochemistry and uh, coulometry and, and various things that are going on. It's, it's uh, really impressive technology and it's, it's what the engineers and, and the, often the business people and even the patent attorneys want to focus uh, the patents on oftentimes. Um, but sometimes it's the, the, the much simpler features that can be just as important or, or more important. In this case, um, on the left side of the strip, you see a, a vertical bar that's just uh, an ink strip that um, is used when you insert the test strip into the meter, it, the ink strip connects two electrical contacts and turns the meter on. So it's just a, a way to, when you put the test strip in the meter, uh, it turns on the meter without you have to, having to uh, press a button to turn it on. Uh, pretty simple technology. I think it's something that you know, could be invented by a, a junior high schooler. Um, but it, it ended up, in, in our case, being very important technology. You, you, in the early 2000s, I mean, you just couldn't sell a meter without um, having that feature. You, know, you couldn't sell a meter that required um, putting the test strip in and, and pushing a button. Uh, it was just thought that um, you know, that's too inconvenient for, for the patient. And so being able to uh, have a patent that covers that technology uh, can be um, very powerful, even if you're not uh, suing others on that. Just having that and uh, other companies that uh, are using that technology and may have patents that cover you, um, having a patent that covers something like that, uh, in our case, turned out to be a very powerful uh, weapon. So uh, the moral of the story here is, is you know, make sure you're focusing the claims uh, on the right things. And in general, that's the, the features that, that really are going to help you make, help you be successful in the, in the marketplace. And the sixth type of loophole is, is uh, as I alluded to before, is, is keeping your patent families alive. And I'll tell you why this is important and how you can tell whether you're, you've done this or not. Uh, and this is different than paying a maintenance fee on an issued patent. Um, when you've got an issued patent, you every four years, basically, you have four, eight, and 12 years after issuance, you have to pay a maintenance fee to keep that patent in force. Uh, what I'm talking about here is, is something different, and it involves filing uh, continuation or continuing applications. And in this first bullet point, I, I show the three different types of continuing applications. Uh, it's a continuation, or a continuation in part, or a divisional. And I, I won't uh, go into the details here of, of what those uh, three, what the differences are between those three different types of continuing applications. But those are, uh, if you're spending any time uh, obtaining patents, you'll hear these three types uh, quite a bit. Um, and so get familiar with those those names, and just know that. Uh, You'll, you'll want to be filing uh, these types of applications to keep your, your patent families alive. Um, in order to keep a, a patent 
Family Alive, you, you must file one of these type of continuing applications while the parent application is still pending. So, for example, you'd file a first application, um, say in the year 2000, uh, maybe it takes a couple years to get it issued. Right before it issues, you want to file, uh, say, a continuation application. Uh, either right before you abandon your original application or before it issues, you, you want to, while it's still pending, you want to file a continuing application. And then that application, you know, may take, um, uh, say, until 2004 to uh, issue. And right before it issues, you want to file another, either a continuation in part or a divisional or another continuation to keep uh, a string of patent uh, applications uh, or patents that are connected together um, alive. And they're all claiming priority back to that original filing in 2000. And the advantage is there is you can um, use that original filing date um, and, and, uh, as you draft new claims in the continuing applications um, that are different than the claims that, from the, the first patent application that, that issued. Uh, and so I've listed uh, some of the main reasons here why you want to keep a, a patent family alive. And the first one is to correct problems in a parent application, as I previously talked about. If you've got a, a means plus function claim that's problematic or uh, some other problem with the claims, um, if you've allowed your first application to issue into a patent without filing a continuing application, you're, you're kind of stuck with what you got. But as long as you've got something still pending uh, in this string of applications, uh, you've left your options open to, to pretty much write whatever claims you want um, that are supported by the original application. Uh, you, you can fix a lot of problems and, and uh, write different claims. And so the second bullet point here is, is draft new claims to cover a new product line not covered by the original claims. Oftentimes, um, a company's technology will change over the years and uh, drift away from the, the claims that were originally drafted to cover it. And if you've kept your patent family alive, you can uh, keep pace with the, the, the changing technology and draft new claims and still go back to that original 2000 filing date uh, and get the benefit of that. Uh, another reason you want to keep patent families alive is to overcome newly discovered prior art. Um, if your patent issues and you later find out that someone else came up with a very similar or the same invention before you and somehow the patent office and you missed that and your, your patent issued, uh, your, your claims, your original claims may become invalid and if you don't have a continuation on file, uh, you're kind of stuck. You, you've lost everything, but uh, you can uh, often overcome that problem if you've got a continuation where you can change the claims a bit. A, uh, a fourth reason to uh, keep your patent families alive uh, allows you to, to draft new claims that are tailored to a, a recent competitor's product. Uh, you can see them come on the market and you can draft claims you know, based on your original description. You can go back and draft very narrow claims but that cover your competitor's product and, and keep them out of the market. And you can make it difficult for all competitors to, to design around your patents because you always have that option of changing your claims if you've kept your patent family alive. And uh, the fifth reason I've given here is uh, it safeguards against changes in the patent law. For example, um, there have been a number of Supreme Court cases recently that have cut back on what is considered uh, patentable subject matter. You may have heard the Supreme Court case Alice um, that uh, narrows a bit, uh, more closely defining what's an abstract idea. And it's made some software patents uh, invalid and some diagnostic uh, testing patents uh, invalid. And if you've got a, um, kept your patent family alive, you're able to oftentimes go back and reword the claims a bit to um, get around the, the change in the patent law. So the seventh type of loophole is, is coordinating the efforts between your, your patent 
people and your 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 regulatory people. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, um, you often have to prove substantial equivalence to a predicate device when you're uh, making a, an FDA filing like a, a 510K. Uh, and uh, you also, when working with the patent office, you have a duty to disclose any relevant prior art that you're aware of to the patent office. And so if you're um, working in silos and your, your regulatory people are, are doing their thing and your patent people are doing their, uh, their own thing and not talking to each other, uh, you can get into problems. Um, first would be if you're, aware, you're obviously aware of the predicate device uh, and you don't disclose that to the patent office, somehow your, your patent attorney doesn't know about this, um, you can uh, end up uh, with an un unenforceable patent because you didn't comply with your, your duty to disclose uh, it to the patent office and that's considered fraud on the patent office, it renders your, your patent unenforceable. Uh, another situation that, that can occur is you're arguing two different positions. Yeah, you can imagine, you know, if you're saying one thing to one federal agency and saying exactly the opposite to another federal agency, that you're going to uh, could easily be accused of a fraud on the, the, the patent office. And this comes up with uh, the regulatory uh, efforts. You're, you've got a predicate predicate device and your goal is to say, hey, we're just exactly like that device. We're, you know, FDA, you've approved that device and we are so similar to that, you should uh, approve our device as well. And you're making all these arguments about how similar your device is to the predicate device. But at the patent office, you're doing just the opposite. You're, you're saying, oh, that predicate device that came before ours, you know, um, that's nothing like what our device is, you know, our device is novel and, and unobvious over that predicate device because we're, we're completely different than that, that device. And oftentimes your, your patent uh, attorney is making different arguments um, to uh, the arguments that are being made uh, by your regulatory folks to the FDA. And you just need to make sure your patent attorney is talking to your, uh, your FDA people, uh, your, your regulatory people and, and uh, you're, you're coordinating your, your arguments. Sometimes you can't have it both ways. You can make arguments saying you're, you're similar in this way, but you're, you're different in another way, but you at least need to be aware of what arguments to be made and, and making sure you're coordinating. And so the last uh, type of loophole I wanted to cover is, is marking products with patent information. Uh, and the purpose of doing this is to provide what's called constructive notice to the public that the article is patented. Uh, and if you fail to do this, you can preclude uh, recovering damages for infringement until effective notice is given. And effective notice is basically writing a cease and desist letter to a competitor um, saying, uh, stop infringing your, your, your product. Uh, and you really don't want to limit yourself to dam damages uh, going back to just the date of that letter. You want to collect damages going back to actually the date when your, your patent um, had issued. Uh, so the, the recently enacted America Invents Act uh, provides patentees with the option of using virtual marking. Uh, before the American Invents Act, you, you needed to put the patent numbers on the, the device itself or uh, at least if they wouldn't fit on the device, put it on the, the packaging. Uh, but now you can just put patent or PAT period and provide a website. And then on the website, you can put all the, list all the patent numbers or um, how that uh, the device is, is covered by patents. Um, and the last uh, bullet point here is um, you've got to be sure not to just um, be marking your own products but if you're licensing your technology to another company, you need to make sure they are marking all of their products too or you lose the ability to uh, take advantage of this uh, patent marking statute. Um, and so when you draft a license uh, to license your technology to another company, you gotta make sure there's a clause in there that requires the company to mark all of its products covered by your patents. So those are the, the eight 
um, different uh, loopholes, I think, are, uh, even if you're not, uh, don't have the desire to get immersed in, in patent law, uh, you can at least uh, quickly look through your, your patents and applications to uh, see if there may be some issues there. Um, and as Joe said, um, copies of these slides are, will be available after the webinar in addition to a, a video of uh, the webinar and, a, and at a later date, a, a translation uh, of the audio. So uh, I think we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, be happy to, to take some questions. And there are a few. The first one is, okay. what is... Uh, on your screen there, it says additional information posted on medtechbriefs.com. What is that? That's um, a website uh, I put together a few years ago um, that just has information that's uh, useful uh, to people in the, the medical device community. It's mainly focused on um, patent law, uh, but occasionally they'll have other news in, in there in the um, regarding uh, regulatory or other uh, uh, areas. Uh, okay. And uh, you can sign up on there for uh, periodic uh, updates. Uh, I used to do it quarterly. It's been a while since I've written an article, but uh, quarterly or, or sometimes monthly, uh, write some articles. Uh, and so there's, there's resources on that, uh, MedTech Briefs, and also you can sign up for these uh, emails. That'll, uh, okay, more good stuff from Doug. Uh, Colin asks a clarifying question. Would it be best if everything that's in the description section is also in the claim section? Um, no, generally there's uh, the description section has a ton of information in it. You can just um, uh, specifically the, the number of elements he asks. If one specifies a number of elements, should all of those be in the claim section? Uh, typically not. Typically it's just the most important elements and um, you leave yourself open. Oftentimes you're just using five or ten percent of what you've described in the claim section. But um, over the years, if you keep your patent families alive, you know, eventually you may um, in, in continuing applications claim further elements, uh, but it's rare that you ever claim all uh, of the elements you've described. You, you wait till they're needed, till you see what's important, um, because there's a, a the first 20 claims you put into a patent application are free um, at the patent office, but beyond that you start paying a charge for an excess claim fee, uh, and so you just and it takes attorney time to write all those claims, so. You know, there are patents with hundreds of claims in them, but it becomes very expensive and typically you don't know um, until years down the road which elements are going to be important. Uh, your technology may change and what you thought was important when you filed the application uh, is no longer important. Um, so it's best to put uh, way more information elements into your description than you think you'll ever need and then over the years you can pick and choose from that menu and, and put those into your claims. Anon asks, even in dependent claims? Um, so a dependent claim is a claim that uh, is narrower than an independent claim. You start off with like an independent claim one and then claim two will depend from claim one and add additional elements. So um, yeah, it's good to have a, a broad range of, of claims, some that are very broad and some of their medium scope and some are very narrow. And you, you do that by adding lots of dependent claims. Um, so it's good to have lots of dependent claims, but again, there's a limit to it. Um, to be cost effective, you, you rarely get to the point where you're putting everything in your description into your claims. Brian wants to know, how much is a patent application fee? So the patent office, um, if you're a small entity, meaning your company under uh, 500 people um, will charge, uh, I think all the filing fees added up cost about $800, or for a micro entity, 
uh, that may get down to four hundred dollars. What is a micro entity? IP, what's that? How many people constitute a micro entity? If you have um, less than five um, patents already uh, that you've applied for, if your annual income is below a certain uh, number, a few other requirements, you can, um, which don't apply to companies, they're usually individual inventors mm -hmm. um, or early okay. stage companies just starting out. That uh, cuts your fees in half again. But the expense you're probably most concerned about is you know, the total expense of, of filing um, a patent application. The, the patent office fees are, are, are typically uh, the, a small portion of that. If you're going to pay a patent attorney to file a patent application, it, you know, it all depends on the situation, the invention, but it's going to be at least a few thousand dollars, uh, typically between five and ten thousand dollars to prepare and file a provisional application and then a, a non-provisional application, you know, typically the cost gets up to uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So it's it's not cheap. Um, it is possible for you to do it yourself. There's a good resource I recommend uh, called a book called um, Patent It Yourself by David Pressman. Uh, you can get this information on the MedTech's MedTechBrief.com uh, website. But uh, Patent It Yourself, uh, put out by Nolo Press. Um, walks you the, through the process and you can um, uh, prepare a patent application yourself or at least get it started and it, it, it's a good resource even if you're working with a patent attorney to um, learn more about patent law. While it uh, sounds expensive for some to spend ten grand on a patent attorney from what you've taught today it sounds scary to maybe try to do this on your own. I mean one mistake and it could cost you many times more. Yeah, I'm sure you have an opinion. I've worked with a lot of inventors who have started out trying to do it themselves and and uh, almost 100% of the time you realize that you, you get what you pay for and, and you're going to make a bigger mess than if you spent a lot of time um, of your own uh, doing it yourself and in the end most realize um, you, know, you really need a patent attorney uh, to do it. But when you're starting out, sometimes you know uh, it's better than nothing. Um, yep. If you just okay. don't have the money early on. Um, getting something on file yourself uh, is, uh, will be better than nothing. I've had a few requests for the slides. I just sent out a link to everyone for that. Uh, Steve asks, can software or artificial intelligence be used to review patents for patent profanity or other loopholes? Um, I bet it could. Uh, I've, I've heard of software uh, over the years being written to, to do various things like write claims, which I don't think, well, uh, I think we're decades away from being able to, to do that. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's written software to look for, for that, but I, I think that's a great idea. Um, uh, I think it'd be very helpful to at least flag these words. Is that a patentable uh, idea for Steve? <laughs> it could be. All yeah. right, there we go. Uh, there might be some aspect of that that's patentable. Stuart asks, how does one decide if it's worth patenting to fill a loophole of a competitor's portfolio? Um, I, uh, the, the loophole here that I'm talking about here, you can't you wouldn't be able to patent, but I think maybe what he's talking about is a gap or something that um, a competitor uh, hasn't covered in their patent application and uh, maybe you could patent. And it, it really is a, it's tough to make any generalization there. It's a, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you'd have to look at it and, and see what the competitor hasn't covered in their patent and what you may be able to uh, yourself um, patent, fill that gap. Uh, you know, what you patent would have to be novel and, and not obvious over what they've patented, so it, uh, it can be tricky, but uh, it, it really depends uh, on, on the particulars of the situation. What about uh, protecting your own IP even if your own company doesn't have freedom to practice? Is that worth it? Um, it, it's still 
would make sense. Um, if you don't have freedom to practice, if you can protect your own IP, and that that ends up covering um, the patents that are that are preventing you to, to having your your freedom to practice, you may be able to horse trade with that uh, that other company and uh, cross license your technologies, and you you would have value in that case. Uh, again, it's, it's uh, it all depends on the situation, uh, but just because you don't have freedom to operate doesn't mean that uh, there might not be something there that you could patent yourself. Um, we are at the top of the hour, but let me squeeze in one or two more uh, questions. Okay. Marek asks, if there's an existing drug indicated for the treatment of disease A, and his group finds that it can also cure disease B, but it's not in the current claims. What is the inference? Um, what is patentable there? Can he patent the cure for disease B? Uh, freedom to operate wise, you, you still may be covered by that patent, but uh, depending on the situation, if you found a new use for an existing uh, drug, you may not be able to get claim. You won't be able to claim the the composition of the drug, but the, you might be able to get a method claim that, uh, that covers the use that new use of that existing drug. Okay, Brian asks: Is there a length of time? Is there a term to a patent, or does it need to be continually updated to avoid obsolescence? Uh, the term. In, of a patent generally is 20 years from the earliest filing date. So that um, does not, it does not start when you file a provisional application, um, but when you file a non-provisional application, 20 years from, from that date um, is the term of the patent. And uh, if you keep the patent family alive, as I talked about, by filing these continuing applications, all of those continuing applications key off the original filing date. So you may be filing uh, 10 years into the life of a patent family. You may be filing a, a continuation. The term of that patent is only going to be another 10 years. Uh, so you ne never get beyond the 20-year date. But you, uh, it is good to keep filing fresh patents uh, on improvements to your technology. So when your original patents expire at the end of 20 years, you've still got some coverage of your products. I suspect uh, you'll need to follow up with Jim on his question, which will be our last. Is Doug at shagland.com the best way to get in touch with you? Would you like to give out your phone number? Um, I uh, do screen my calls, so yes, the email's the, the best way to okay. uh, Jim get asks, of me. are there any suggestions on overcoming obviousness when patenting IP for miniaturizing and making an existing technology or device portable for remote uses? Um, there are limitations on, uh, it is difficult to just miniaturize something and uh, get a patent on it. If it's already known in a larger scale and all you're doing is making it smaller, uh, it, uh, the patent office's initial reaction is going to be, well, that's obvious. Uh, but it's not impossible. I've done it before. If there's serious challenges to making it smaller uh, and you put enough limitations in your claims, you can uh, patent something um, that's already known, but, uh, but you've made it smaller. I'm sorry, what was the second part of that uh, question? And making it available for remote or portable uses. Yeah, the, the test comes down to, to uh, to, to get a patent, something has to be useful, uh, it has to be novel, and it has to be unobvious. And, you know, that could be a topic of many webinars of what constitutes unobviousness. But, um, so just making something portable oftentimes is obvious, but there, there may be aspects of how you've made it portable that, that can be patented. It does sound like a good subject for your next blog post. So we'll look for that at MedTech Briefs. And I'm confident I'm speaking on behalf of those who attended today and for those who will listen to this presentation in the future. Thank you, Doug. This was very informative.
Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you very much. A lot of thank yous being typed into the comments here. Thank you, Doug. We'll speak again soon. Goodbye, everyone. Oh, great. Thank you.